Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for the 26th SF Indie Fest. So excited to have you all here. Uh, the festival runs from February 8th through 18th at the Historic Roxy Theater, as well as online in your digital computer space. Uh, thank you so much to our online documentary shorts filmmakers for joining us. Welcome, everybody. So lovely to have you join us here. Uh, I'd love to just kick things off by getting to know who you all are. So if you could let us know uh, your name, uh, the film that you're here with, and what your role was on the film. And we'll start off with our double trouble up here with Judy and Joey. Hi, welcome. Hi, thanks Thank for having you. us. Go ahead, Judy. Um, okay, so I'm Judy Drozd, and I am co-producing, co-directing, editing, shooting a series of oral history films of which The Solomon Project is one. And um, I will pass it to Joey. I'll try to be brief. Uh, this is a, a I'm, I'm in the, the departure lounge. I'm at a certain age. I have a career behind me. I have invested a mass archive of my work. I'm an artist. I'm a social political media satirist. I use the media as a medium. I create plausible but non-existent fake realities that I stage to fool the press and the public. I then reveal the truth to show how we are being manipulated. I have hidden messages in all of my works or issues in my works. So it's not just about fooling the media. I call myself a cultural proctologist because I look at buttholes every day. Um, this is, uh, this is uh, a way of saving my work. I have buildings filled with my, my art, from paintings to sculpture, to drawings, to photographs, to movies, to you name it. And what do I do with it? Who's going to take care of it? Who wants it? Who can store it? Who can maintain it? So rather than worry about all of that, I thought if I made stories or utilized my archive into completing the stories that I've done over the years, it's a film. And the film could be seen and shared by everyone anywhere at any time. So this is a way of conserving, preserving my work. And there are individual stories. Uh, the current one that you just, you just watched, Solomon Project, Solomon Project uh, is one of, of <laughs> scores of stories that we've recorded. And we are now putting the backup archival material to go with my telling of the story. Thank you That's so it. much, Joey. Hi, Victoria. Uh, go ahead and introduce yourself and let us know your role and what film you're here with. Hi, everyone. I'm Victoria Barbarito. I'm the director and editor of Lengua de Diamante, also known as Diamond Tongue. Um, yeah, I'm an artist. I'm a documentary filmmaker. I'm also a postpartum doula, um, currently living in Brooklyn, New York. Really happy to be here with you all. Lovely, thank you so much. Hi, David. Hey there, my name is David Grabius and I'm a filmmaker. I'm produced and directed Flight Path and I'm joining you from beautiful Los Angeles, California today. <laughs> thank you so much, welcome. Hi, Swan, welcome. Hey, thank you very much for having me. Uh, so my name is uh, Sven Werner. I um, wrote and uh, uh, directed the uh, short film uh, My Digital Truth. And uh, what could the subject possibly be? Obviously, it's myself. Um, but it wasn't uh, the fact that I woke up one day and decided, oh, let's make a, a documentary. Um, it was more like a personal, uh, if you want, a moment of crisis. And on the one side, I had to work out what that means for me. I wanted to remember. Uh, wanted also to uh, find a different way of expressing some, if you want, insights or learnings uh, from that time. And it was a very, I would say, organic process. And the outcome is what it is. I'm uh, very glad, very often I say it's very experimental. Um, it started really as from the idea to say, how could you really animate literature? Uh, and uh, the tools that uh, then became available at the time were artificial intelligence. Everything is uh, produced with artificial intelligence. And this is really sort of the concept at the moment is interplay uh, between, if you want, authenticity, who we are, and uh, modern technology. Lovely. Thank you so much. And you actually answered the, the next question, which is, uh, what was the genesis of your project and how did you come to bring it to life? So thank you so much. And we'll go back over to David. Can you speak to how you found Flight Path and decided to tell the story? Sure. We had uh, we produced for for PBS a a pilot called uh, Night Shift, which looked at people who work who have jobs that make them work at night. 
and then explored social issues that came out of their experiences. And uh, we wrapped up the project, but we still had a big file of research. And there was an article that we had found about wildlife researchers who work at night. And there was just a line about this project in Palm Springs. And um, I don't know, I just, uh, it, there was something about it and I looked into it and I ended up calling the company that that Sarah and the film works for. Um, and they were excited and they introduced me to Sarah. And then I drove out from Los Angeles to Palm Springs where she was working and spent a night with her. And um, yeah, and I just fell in love with her and the work and that space and the environment. And, uh, you know, and at that point, that that first night I spent out with her, she told me her backstory about her partner passing. And um, suddenly it went from just someone who was doing a really crazy job at night to this really powerful, you know, story of, of, uh, of grief and all that. And, um, you know, at that point you just got to make it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I think you do such a beautiful job of like blending this personal journey with like the very like public facing work that Sarah is doing um, to really show the things that like motivate us to do good and continue on. So thank you so much, David. Thank you. Victoria, like, how did you find this subject? Like, what made you tell this story? Yeah, so during early COVID 2020 into 2021, I was living in Northern Virginia near family. And my partner said, there's this woman that you have to meet. I think you, you two will have a lot to talk about. And Elsa and I did 10 minutes into our first conversation, you know, we're both tearing up and she's telling me the story of of her son's birth and you know as a birth worker we we got into that very quickly because I just had questions about her life and her story and it was really clear that there was a connection and and a great you know friendship there and I said I have to I have to make a project with you if if you'll be open to it and she couldn't be more excited so we we dove in pretty pretty soon after that. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, Judy, how did you get intertwined with this rapscallion here um, and decide to you know, help document this uh, like past work and bring this film and eventually series to light? Well, we met about three weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've been working together. I've been working with Joey for a long time and also helping him with his archive, which as he described is very large. And- uh, Produced Art of the Prank. Right. Um, produced a movie called Art of the Prank, which is a documentary, feature length documentary about Joey's work. Uh, so I am probably the second best expert on his work in the world. <laughs> and uh, it, interesting that you said COVID because this all really pretty much came out of being- uh, Stuck. <laughs> very much stuck in, during COVID. And uh, we decided to do the series, just kind of jumped into it. And um, it, it, the rest is history, really. Lovely, thank you. Uh, Joey, I think that your work is so interesting in this time. And I think that the work of oh. archival is really interesting because through the lens of yesterday, we can kind of measure how far we've come or haven't come. Right. So uh, I guess I would love to hear from you about what it means to kind of look back at your past work and this moment in time that we are in geopolitically in terms of like the way that media talks about the world that we're living in right now. Well, I think what I hope everyone finds is that it's still relevant. Uh, I, I, I was doing AI 30 years ago. Uh, I was doing all kinds of things that were ahead of the curve. And now that we're going back and looking at the material and retelling the stories, they're relevant. And that's an important thing for any artist to maintain relevance. Uh, do, you have a, do you have a pointed question for me? I don't remember what you asked me. Um, I asked you about how you feel about looking back at your work now, given that it feels like we have oh, kind of well, stagnated. Well, in well, besides moment. besides seeing yourself get old, <laughs> it's uh, it's 
I don't know what to say about it because it's, it's not a challenge. I tell stories. I'm a storyteller. I created the story. I tell a story. I'm telling a story again and I'm looking at all of them. It's like there, there's a, a number of different me's at different stages in my life, all adding to the presenting of the story. Because we go back and forth in time. Lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Swen, so uh, since we're talking about, you know, AI and technology, I wonder if you could uh, elaborate a little bit more about how you um, put together your project and decided to use like the personal journey with AI as kind of the lens that you explore. Um. So what happened at the time um, was um, basically I had to leave um, uh, work also related to, to personal illness. And um, I had um, sort of various doctors and everyone had their opinion as always, um, but nobody could really figure out what it was. And so you're thinking, hmm, uh, there's all this data available. I'm definitely not a medical professional, um, but there must be a way of um, uh, testing and uh, getting access to this information and, and finding a way to analyze it. And uh, I have a career in uh, financial services. And so in the past, you know, I would have gone to my IT department and they built a wonderful machine and suddenly I didn't have this available and you feel really helpless in, in terms of making sense of this. And this is how I got into AI really saying, well, I can take all of this data and really uh, analyze it. And then from there you go to saying, hmm, uh, well, uh, the uh, imaging AIs are now becoming available. And in fact, actually, the the film itself has been uh, where there are people um, moving, etc., has been filmed, and then the filming, the actual footage, is being used um, as a prompt uh, to the AI uh, to then uh, produce the animation. But I wanted this bit of a serial, if you want, a feeling to it. That's why uh, everything is done uh, through through an AI. But from my perspective, <laughs> and also you had the question earlier about looking back. Now, obviously, from when I did this uh, in the beginning of uh, 2023, so last year, uh, to now, you learn a lot how to use this technology. So sometimes I wish like, mm, if I would do this now, this would like, <laughs> uh, look like, you know, like a, a Marvel movie and no longer like a sort of what it was six months ago. So I think that is sort of amazing how quickly and fast it changes. And really, if you want the uh, the stuff that it allows me to do, that would have been, I would say, unthinkable like uh, only a year ago. Lovely. Thank you so much. Uh, I would love to now turn to talking about the relationship between filmmaker and subject. Um, and David, I'd love to start with you. Like how, when you got to know Sarah kind of in a slightly different context, how did you approach getting to turn the lens to be a bit more of a personal journey? Like what was that process like, the, the, the trust building and all that? Sure. Well, I mean, I think, you know, I mean, uh, you know, whatever, every film is a relationship and it's a collaboration and all that kind of stuff. And I think so much of the process is going and spending time. I mean, I went out and spent a couple of days a night with her, um, you know, without filming, just hanging out, trying to understand her world. And, uh, you know, and the purpose of that is both to understand how to capture it, how to film it in the best way, you know, in a way that that honors it and respects it and and represents it um you know but it's also it gives time for me to to discover her and for her to discover me and in that way to understand what the film should really be about you know so as opposed to me going in and saying all right we're gonna do this and that's what i want and, you know um it becomes a much more collaborative process and she by by spending that time with her in advance without filming she's able to start to understand who again like i said who i am and what what a film what the process is and what a film could be and she's actually able to provide inspiration and creative ideas um that help to shape what it is um so like i said for example when i first um approached her i had no idea about her backstory i just thought she was you know just a, another person in the desert looking for dead stuff and uh you know, over time, as she kind of, you know, opened up and started to share that with me, and we talked about what that meant and how that connected to the work that was there. Um, you know, suddenly it, the film wasn't just about the work that this one person did, but it was, a, as as I think you said earlier, it's about the why this person was doing this work. Um, you know, and then that also informed how we filmed, right? Like the 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 filming. You know, we wanted the work 
to be the main focus and to, you know, to show how the work was engendering this emotional journey for her. So a lot of it was, you know, the, the putting the camera in the desert and letting things unfold in front of the frame, lots of wide shots, lots of static stuff, letting the audience discover the kind of the, the mundane and, um, you know, the details of that world and how they, uh, you know, impact her. Um, and, uh, yeah, you know, and then, you know, structurally just, you know, having her provide, you know, tell that backstory and then the film kind of plays and you forget about it. And at the very end, she kind of reminds you, which again, felt like, um, was a, very similar to the conversations we'd had with her in terms of how she connected her past and present lives. But, um, but yeah, that collaboration and letting the film uh, be inspired by the person who's in it, I think is so important. Um, so that was really, that was our process. Lovely, thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, Victoria, how about you? How did you get to, I mean, you, you've mentioned already that you, how you met Elsa, but like, how did you approach uh, the filmmaking process, get comfortable with each other and get access to telling her story? Yeah, once once I knew that she was open to being in a film with me, um, I just started spending time with her and her family, with her son Diego and her husband Bennett, and they couldn't have been more welcoming to have me just spend time around the house, getting to know them. Um, I, I think food also was a, a large part in building a, a relationship and, and you know, seeing where Elsa gravitates towards around the house and the things that she was creating, a lot of that, uh, a lot of that came through just over a meal or being in the kitchen with her, helping her cook. Um, and and once we actually started filming, the same went for my small crew. Um, they we kind of just moved around the house and. It was almost like a dance. She she very much, you know, was she I, I think that her life as a performer early on um in her life, she was very used to I, I think she was so happy to have people around just wanting to hear her reflect on past and present and future. Um that you know, the relationship that we had built beforehand obviously came through, but it was also just me being so willing to like absorb these stories. And she was so willing to, to, to talk um, for hours in the best way possible. <laughs> <laughs> That's lovely. Thank you so much. Uh, Judy and Joey, I know that you've been working together for quite some time, but can you talk about how you met and how you decided to collaborate on your film? No. <laughs> All right, great. Great seeing you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. <laughs> how about you, Judy? Uh, well, um, how we met is a very long story from very, very long time ago. Um, how we've evolved over time, I think is more interesting. Uh, Joey's wanted to do an oral history series for a very, very long time, and I didn't have time to do it, which is why when COVID hit, <laughs> it really wiped out the rest of the world. And we were able to jump in and do it. Um, we were very limited in what we could do because we were locked in. Well, let me add that we're on an isolated farm in the middle of nowhere. So that that's condition number one. Yeah, really. So, I mean, ultimately... Which we enjoy. Ultimately, kind of miraculously, we set Joey in the dining room window. And at a certain time in, in the day, we had the perfect light outside. And probably over a period of three weeks, he told 40 plus stories, which we're now kind of working through. And this, this story is number nine, actually, in the series. Um, it's a web series, ultimately, um, because they're short films and who knows how we'll, we'll end up distributing them. Uh, but we're just extremely excited that you've selected this film and that you're showing it to people and it's sort of helping to launch the project and we really appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. Oh, that's lovely. Well, thank you all so much. That's all the time we have today.
for Q&A. So excited to have your films and to be able to show them to the world. Um, so thank you all and thank you so much to our audience for tuning in and have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you.